it's great to be back. Um, I have to say it, it was last century since I've been back to web. Uh, first time on this side versus where you all are. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk today about this concept of STEM-based venture innovation startups, quote unquote, going out to sea. Um, one of my classmates, Dave Kring, uh, uh, who's now at Raytheon, uh, when we were just comparing notes after not seeing each other for a few decades. He kind of went, which my bio probably sounded like, it's like, it sounds like what you did in your career is like a bucket list. You kind of did a lot of things. So I can hopefully connect all that to why uh, what we're doing today at Sea Ahead and what it particularly means, I think, is really exciting about the future of global maritime, which you all are uh, the beginning parts of. All right, so getting started, just going to just reintroduce something that's obvious. We're going to start really high level. Um, I've been in sustainability. I've been in clean tech, renewable energy, electric cars, LED lighting, messed around a little bit of organic food. There's a whole ecosystem around all those sectors, but the ocean, the ocean is only just starting now to get attention. So out of sight, out of mind. Just the importance of the ocean, which I think we're all aware of, is not everybody, though, is it generates uh, half of our oxygen. It's our CO2. Uh, absorber, it's also a heat sink. Um, and more than a billion people in the world still depend on the ocean for their primary source of protein. <coughs> and we're, we as humanity are not good stewards of what's happening to the ocean. You know, the, the United Nations states that roughly 90% of global fisheries are at or overfished. This is, a, this is a, from the NOAA website. This is, an elite, this is a fishing vessel with its transponder turned off doing not good, very good things. Uh, impact on the environment. There's 360 right whales left on the Atlantic right whales. I think three breeding females were killed in the last few months. Um, some say 8 million metric tons of plastic. I think that's really hard to estimate, but this, someone did try and take a guess, uh, goes off uh, out to sea. It's important for us. Uh, not for you all, but for the general public or the venture world or the impact world or even sometimes policymakers, it's just, just out of sight, out of mind, not realizing that the backbone of the global economy is global shipping. So it's very important for us as the ocean uh, from an economics perspective. Um, demographics, if you follow the I-95 quarter, uh, most of America lives off of the I-95 quarter from Boston all the way down past DC. That global trend of moving to urbanization, which tends to be on the coast, increases. And with that means there's more uh, impact uh, on our coasts. And then, of course, uh, the climate change driven issues. But not all of the climate change. Acidification, sea level rise, definitely nitrates. Almost everything we do as humans washes out to sea. We use a lot of fertilizers, we get our cheap food, washes out to sea. Right? So, has anyone, everyone heard the term a theory of change? No? Okay, so a theory of change is if you're in front of, let's say, a family foundation that wants to promote sustainability, and they'll challenge you if you're making a proposal, well, what's your theory of change? So what I just described is the problem, right? The, the ocean is, the, the issues with the ocean today as we industrialize the ocean more are as cute as ever, and it's important to us as, as ever as the ocean. So what's your theory of change? So that's what we, we started to see ahead around an, trying to answer that question. So what is different? So the second bullet point here is what hasn't happened until recently is this concept of entrepreneurship tied to the ocean economy. Startups looking to do the double bottom line, having your cake and eat it too. I'm gonna try and tackle some of these sustainability issues through innovation, usually STEM-based, and that hasn't been done before. There's, there's marine scientists, there's marine engineers, there's oceanographers, there's policy, there's regulatory, but so what is new is this concept of, hmm, startups. Um, so why startups? Making a big generalization, because I've been working with startups for maybe 20, 25 years of my career. A um, Couple things about startups, one, include you all, with your, um, as you're still in school, you're not necessarily bounded by existing paradigms. Simple example, if you're doing aquaculture, if it's saltwater, you're under the NOAA. If it's a catfish and it's freshwater, you're under the USDA. Those are artificial government, historical, regulatory trends. 
So we're seeing sometimes for the first time, I was like, I don't have to follow any of these existing paradigms. What I'm doing on land can go out to sea. I don't necessarily know bow from astern, starboard from port, but I think I can work on a maritime space. Two, uh, startups usually can move faster and even see the opportunity taking advantage of technology. Um, rapid advances, particularly in tech. Uh, we're seeing the first ocean uh, digital twins. We're seeing advanced sensors that are driven off of your uh, cell phone or automotive. And they're saying, well, you know, maybe I can do hyperspectral imaging based on learning how to use PowerPoint. But um, um, <laughs> maybe with these advanced sensors that are getting only cheaper and more powerful, if you've been in a new car recently, um, maybe, I can do, maybe I can take that semiconductor and I can measure carbon, whether that be in this flue gas on a stack or your nature-based solution for coastal resiliency. So startups not follow, don't follow existing paradigms. They tend to move faster, and they particularly can capitalize on technology trends versus the incumbents. And the maritime industry is a traditionally conservative, slower-moving sector. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about some case studies. Uh, these are a couple movies that I've been in, um, meaning, so this will date me after, not long after Webb, uh, when I was at General Electric, solar. Is the cost of photovoltaics gonna drop? Is the cost of offshore wind gonna, uh, wind gonna drop that it hits an inflection point and you get mass adoption? So the traditional coal-fired central utility moving to decentralized renewables. That path continues today. Globally, renewable energy is growing faster than coal. It's intuitive, as it should be. Maybe it should be faster. The, the second example, Obnoxious example is uh, big three to electric. I work for General, Motor, uh, General Electric. We were teamed up with General Motors. I remember the engineering team uh, ridiculing this, this little go-kart out in California. Um, and, but the point being was that, uh, the two points there was one, that the large incumbents didn't see a startup such as Tesla coming. And as we know, he doesn't follow any rules. Once again, uh, big three, ice, internal combustion engine, in the process of electrifying. Three, uh, food, driven by, I think you guys are called the Generation Alpha. Is that right? Generation Alpha Z millennials. Started by the younger millennials. Uh, what's different about that demographic in the U.S. generalizing? One is they, they live differently. I want a job in this city because this is where I want to live versus my parents' generation, my generation. I'm living here because I got a job. Uh, I want to know what I eat. I want to know um, the sustainability of what I consume. So those market trends have manifested itself in not so many words as why Campbell's soup stock price looks like this. And then meanwhile, you have startups such as Annie's who are being acquired or their stock price when they IPO go like that. So, all right. So what's the point about these three case studies? Uh, three large, historically siloed sectors that we need, uh, either facing regulatory change, technology change, or consumer change, some of them, all three at the same time. And as all three of these continue to evolve, startups have played an anchor role to the point where maybe using Tesla as an example, even a destructive role. So the question for eventually I'm going to get to see ahead is when is it the ocean economy's turn? Uh, going back to solar, um, on, on why you got to start somewhere. Usually there's government policy, uh, whether that be re you're forced to do renewables or you're forced to reduce your emissions and or a lot of uh, subsidies. I call that the carrot and the stick. Uh, started in Germany. If solar today, if you have solar in your house, your parents have solar in your house, thank the German ratepayer. It was there, it was a German policy of the feed-in tariff that started solar back in the late eight, 90s. So what's this curve? It's a simple cost of, I'm old enough to say I started before 2015 in solar, so this curve was even higher to the left. And uh, at the different colors are just different whether you're in front of the meter or behind the meter, residential, commercial, wholesale. But the curves, it's an X. As solar continues to drop in price, it, of course, it increases the efficacy and the, and the, uh, and the payback period. So. Uh, global ins installations go down. So this is a good case study of why something could be very expensive, not applicable, late 90s, uh, and today uh, it's almost ubiquitous. Solar is, I find it boring. 
right? It's, you got financing, the technology, not a lot of huge changes. Just another point on, on the solar as a case study. Uh, and, and there's some issues around political economy with what relative to what China did to the global sector. But that's a separate story. But the idea of today's solar today is based on Kristen silicon technology. It's not much different than what Jimmy Carter had. So actually, there hasn't been a lot of huge technology innovation in solar. Doesn't mean there were maybe $10 billion worth of attempts to do other types of solar technologies like thin film. But case study, once again, is this is a clean tech study and then followed by uh, five to 10 years later. This is the lithium ion battery pack cost curve. Um, my Uber picked me up at LaGuardia. It was a brand new EV SUV. He had the regenerative braking turned on really high. Got me car sick. <laughs> I thought he was riding the brake. I'm like, um, all right. So when I first started to look at electric batteries when we invested at GE, the battery pack was about $1,500 a kilowatt hour. That's to the far left. Today, and this curve only goes out to 2022, 20, it's probably about 100 bucks a kilowatt hour. Same, same thesis about solar. So what is it about our cars? This is the ID4. We expect them to last. We expect them not to catch fire. That's nice. We expect them to be relatively affordable. Right, so from that, and the billions of dollars that continue to invest in today's lithium ion technology, this is assuming no, um, I didn't say this, I had a, form, a VC buddy say there's liars in the world and there's battery CEOs, meaning um, Hewton, assuming no, no nonlinear changes in the cathode or, or the anode or the electrolyte, today it's mostly about scale and, and engineering, and that's driving this cost curve, and that enables the first time, which is what we, want, we care about going out to sea. This is Crowley's, it's really cute, isn't it? Uh, electric tugboat um, scheduled to be commissioned in San Diego. So the, the, if you run the numbers on running this um, electric tugboat today versus even five or six years ago, if the battery pack is less than half the cost, right? It's, it's moving in the right direction. Once again, you don't have to invent it on the ocean is this is automotive derivative. I'm gonna assume that that battery pack comes from an automotive derivative battery pack uh, for a number of reasons it should. Okay, um, so we call it blue tech. Blue tech is relatively a new term. There's ag tech, there's biotech, climate tech, which has replaced clean tech. That's what I started at clean tech 1.0. Uh, so the first reaction we get from people when we talk about innovation tied to the ocean it's like some kind of niche. Sounds like something I donate to. Now, having raised money before, that's, I can read that code wording. That code wording is like, I don't think there's an investment thesis here. I don't, I think it's really small. Well, we're headquartered in Cambridge. I don't live there, but we're in uh, Kendall Square, smack in the middle of MIT's campus. That Kendall Square is not just MIT. It's an epicenter of corporate and uh, uh, startup innovation. Uh, it's just buzzing as, a, as an epicenter for greater Boston. So our thesis around defining blue tech, it's actually, it doesn't have to be invented on the waterfront, right? We can bring crossover technologies. Let's use a simple example, something that none of us have a background in, biotech, life science. We've seen at least two or three of our startups do an engineered feed. Um, we still catch a lot of wild small fish, grind it up, make fish meal, and that's your farmed salmon. So even if it's farmed, it's not necessarily sustainable as we over, going back to the overfishing. So now there's a question of using biotech to engineer feed design for whatever we're trying to raise. So that's a biotech example. Uh, food and ag, um, that is, whether that be ag tech, if I can try and count carbon over the crop, why can't I try and count carbon 150 yards off the coast in the marshland? So um, we're also seeing uh, technologies to reduce nitrates. We consider that blue tech because everything washes out to sea. Once we see that, we can look at anything. Climate, I'm gonna talk more about clean tech and climate tech uh, later when we really focus on shipping. Circular economy, um, what's biodegradable on, uh, in the dirt for let's say a certain new type of plastic is not necessarily biodegradable at sea. So we just take an ocean-centric view of, of, of the circular economy. And then the, probably the biggest is that bottom right is, is just tech across the board. Uh, the power of computing, the drop in uh, cost of hardware, as I mentioned, 
Uh, you have new advances from AR, VR. I'll give you an example there. I'll give you an example of data analytics later applied out to sea. So while we're running around Cambridge, it doesn't have to be Cambridge, it could be New York, it could be California. The startups that we see, you know, they usually come looking for us. And the conversation comes something like this. Uh, I'm graduating computer science. I don't want to work for Facebook. What do you got? And usually they have an idea. And, and then they say, I don't know a bow from a stern, starboard from port, or a fin from a shell. What can you show me? Right. So these are the type of startups you're seeing, which we love. Because especially if they're going after a different sector, that's, then there's some diversity um, on risk perspective. If you try and sell into global shipping, which could be slow, go kill it in ag or climate tech or on the urban waterfront. So once we say that, then our actually, Tim, total addressable market, scope of the potential of bringing technologies out to sea is actually massive. And then we're told we're too broad, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, so we're talking startups. We're not talking uh, nonprofits. And uh, I had the, when I helped start the clean tech venture group, um, group at General Electric, around renewables and diesel emission control technologies. I just took a tour of the marine engineering lab, great memories. Um, and, uh, you know, NOx, SOx, particulate matter, all that. I had to make the business case. And someone else once said to me at a reception, was like, I don't know how you don't know the WWF, the Nature Conservancy, EDF, all these environmental groups, considering what you do. And I was a little taken aback, and I realized on the drive home, like, yeah, because I, I couldn't even go near them because I always had to make the business case of why innovation, early stage, and sustainability intersected. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the high level. What's the business case of why you can have your cake and eat it too? One is, is the, this, this report now is heavily uh, quoted, but when it first came out, you can, give a, you can give the OECD credit was, the ocean economy's been around since man has been on the water, right? But it really, maybe for the first time, it's being looked at as the ocean economy as opposed to seafood part of food, uh, shipping part of logistics, transportation, maybe. Uh, offshore oil and gas, just part of oil and gas. So the OECD report looked at the whole global ocean economy and concluded this, is essentially that the, the ocean economy is growing at twice the rate of global GDP. So that's a double-edged sword. One, on the business side, that's an economic argument. Uh, essentially, it's intuitive. We are just asking and demanding more from the ocean from an economic perspective. The double-edged sword is that if you're an environmentalist, the, the argument, which is true, is that the industrialization of the ocean increases, going back to my, how I, I kicked off. But there's an economic story simply at the top level. We want more protein. There's more shipping tied to uh, economic growth. We're gonna put, which I'm gonna talk about, we're gonna put 20 to 30 gigawatts of offshore wind off our east coast, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is our, our, our thesis, is that blue tech, the timing, timing is everything. I've been a little early. You know, sometimes you're, as an ex-army guy, if you're really early, you kind of get shot in the face and the guy behind you walks over your back. Uh, we think blue tech globally the time is now, and just to summarize over why, what I mentioned technologies. There's a lot of the, the technologies, whether they be a catalyst or tech, uh, continues its uh, efficacy curve going up and its cost curve going down. Regulatory pressure. Um, I, at General Electric, focused on diesel engines, electrification. It's a, that's the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, EPA, California CARB. Global shipping was pretty much given a free pass over this time. The only reason why global shipping was even uh, at that point regulated was because they entered U.S. waters or European waters. Um, but global shipping, what you do, when you're doing deep at sea, uh, not really thought about from the regulators until now. United Nations, IMO 2050 being the biggest loaded gun to the head of global shipping. But I will say about regulatory, it's a matrix. It's, you have the UN, you have a regional level. The European Union, in my opinion, is pressuring uh, the UN to finish up the UN IMO 2050 with a, with a very veiled threat saying, if you don't get your act together, we're a signator by the way, uh, we're gonna regulate carbon in the European Union. So it's analogous to, if, to what happened with, with cars 20, 30 years ago in California, the 
the automotive industry did not want two standards for automotive commissions, California versus the feds. I think President Trump tried to, hopefully it was the last attempt to try and reverse that. But that same dynamic, the European Union is essentially saying, if you don't get your act together at the sovereign level, at the international sovereign level, we'll do it at the regional level. Uh, going back one level lower than that, then there's national, EPA, then there's provisional, California, and then there's municipality, Port of LA. So it's not as if there's one regulatory driver on global shipping that if industry can make it go away, that all these issues from the regulatory driver will go. And then market drivers. Market drivers is primarily driven um, by um, what's good about clean tech 1.0 is that usually when you're reducing emissions through e increased efficiency, you also save money. That's a nice parallel track. Um, the second market driver, other than trying to just make more money and be more efficient, is for the first time you're seeing, has anybody heard the term ESG? No? Um, remember what it stands for? Yeah. Awesome. So, a little controversial, uh, a little political, which it wasn't political, it shouldn't be political, but ESG is showing up at the board level. You can like it, you not like it. U.S. companies are starting to adopt ESG principles. The Europeans are light years ahead of us. So if, even if we go backward and a lot of our corporates and don't follow ESG standards on our board, the Europeans already are. BMW today made a press release is whoever ships our car, we audit them and they have to show us, for example, is how the ship is recycled. You know, uh, full throttle uh, on a beach of Sri Lanka and 10,000 people with uh, barefoot with uh, torches ain't gonna cut it. So that, that's an ESG principle beyond just making a bottom line. So that is a market driver of um, um, Amazon. Amazon has invested in a couple of clean shipping deals. Why? Because they're looking at scope three emissions. Scope one, scope two, scope three. If, if that's, uh, that's n now new terminology around shipping. It's like how much I emit, how much does my factory emit, how much does my supply chain emit. So we think that the, that the, mo the momentum, the tide is going towards more sustainability, which means more innovation tied uh, to our ocean economy. Um, some real numbers, a little busy, sorry. Uh, maritime shipping could be one, one and a half trillion if you're gonna decarbonize shipping. 50% reduction by 2050, I believe 2008 benchmark. I talked about circular economy, uh, that's driven by us as consumers, we're more sensitive, it's like it's heavily packaged, how's it made? Uh, will, it do, will it biodegrade at sea? I still cut up. I don't know if it's an exercise in fruition. You know, the, if you got um, plastic, um, because you know we all seen the pictures of the turtles and the such. The point is that we consumers are more aware, and we. Um, and what's interesting about the consumer side is that it, the market reacts really fast to us consumers. Uh, aquaculture. I mentioned aquaculture. Nine billion people. That's linear. Um, but if you add 1.2 billion Chinese, maybe another 1 billion South Asians reaching middle class. So the protein consumption per capita as Asia reaches middle class, layered on top of sim simpler, simply linear growth of population demand means that we're just gonna take more protein out from wherever it is sustainable or not, including um, aquaculture and fisheries. Offshore wind, I'll talk about a little bit more. Coastal resiliency. Um, this is intuitive, but it isn't called a sector yet, but sea level rise. Well, who's on the ocean? Rich people, not so many rich people, real estate, municipalities. So the spend is probably at least the first cut as a trillion dollars a year. And I'll talk about a couple examples of startups that are looking at coastal resiliency. And the one that's the farthest out is not as mature is blue carbon. Um, lastly, the nice little pretty graphic that I had our designer do on the bottom, um, your left, is one is, since we don't work for anybody, is, to my earlier point, is we could take any view we like of the world. So we take a spatial, what we call a systems view. So what does that mean? We go 75 miles inland, we go 100 miles off the coast, we take NASA satellites, and we go all the way down to maybe AUVs with advanced sensors uh, right off the coast at the bottom of the ocean. The point is, by taking a spatial systems view with the coast as its epicenter, that's what's different. 
uh, everything is under our umbrella. Whether that be, and so I'll give an example of some startups that start with satellite technology. NASA doesn't care who uses that technology. All the way, to, as I mentioned earlier, to ag, which is starting to think about maybe what happens when it goes out to sea, but they're really focused first about reducing the footprint uh, 100 miles inland to, I'll talk about power to X uh, in a minute. Um, offshore wind. We have a flat seabed. California doesn't. Uh, we have high wind speeds. So uh, a little political, again, um, we're targeting 20 to 30 gigawatts of offshore wind from Massachusetts down to North Carolina. The numbers are massive. This is a once in two generations, probably opportunity for the US where in order to build these wind turbines, you have to have infrastructure investments on the port. So this is right in front of us. Um, if you're on a BQE, um, as you pass that, now it's all trendy, it wasn't when I was there, under the Brooklyn Bridge, the, the merry-go-round and, and uh, all those high-end apartments now, you hit this dead space. That dead space is where Equinor is gonna do lay-down space for making their wind turbines. And right next, on top of that, they're gonna start an offshore wind startup incubator. You keep going past the Costco, Statue of Liberty is to your right, Wall Street, uh, the Brooklyn Army Terminal, where we shipped out probably millions of soldiers in the last 100 years. New York City is gonna spend $100 million turning that into a climate tech hub. So, centered around the working waterfront and offshore wind. It's an amazing opportunity for us, not just on getting high capacity factor renewable energy, but the amount of infrastructure investment that's gonna happen on our coast. And this is the intersection with maritime because it's at sea and it starts in a port. <laughs> so we get asked, um, what is, what do you, what's an example of how you look at startups that have to do with, let's say, stick to the East Coast and offshore wind? One, um, there's a big question about enhancing biodiversity, whether that be protecting marine mammals to reducing, let's say, um, clearing wetlands and as such. Uh, I'll, I'll give an example about ocean data, which is tied to the tech point I made earlier. I'll give another example about using tech um, for workforce development, using AR, VR. That's the one on your top right. I mentioned the EV tugboat. If blue states, uh, which are pushing renewables, and you start building 20 to 30 gigawatts of offshore wind, and you have 700 diesels running around, Building those, vests, uh, building those wind turbines around ports, and who lives in those neighborhoods? Typically people of color, lower income. So there's an there's a environmental justice perspective. The data is there if you look at, uh, let's say, childhood asthma heat maps. Dark red by the ports, typically communities of color. That ain't gonna fly. So uh, working with this Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, uh, it's still, they're still focused on clearing a lot of the, um, uh, in order to get the mandate to actually start constr um, further construction on some of the projects, but the question of greening the ports, greening the supply chain, and that intersects with maritime. I'm gonna to talk to Power to X in a minute, and then I mentioned the end of life challenge. So we're seeing startups around, this is one way to cut the offshore wind supply chain from an innovation perspective. We are in Boston, I mentioned why. Um, the United States is a global leader in venture capital, full stop but it's not spread evenly like peanut butter. It's California, but California doesn't like hardware, and they're impatient. Some people think that Silicon Valley should drop the name Silicon. Who isn't afraid of hardware? Who is a little more patient, a little more conservative, doesn't have the velocity? Boston, New York, right here. Number two and number three in the world on venture capital. Um, so what do we do? <laughs> what, what does Sea Ahead does do? So, we said we wanted to push innovation tied to the ocean six years ago. Nobody knew, had any clue, including you know, the incumbents like Woods Hole uh, and, and as such. So we said, one, we have to catalyze. So we did events, we did business plan competitions, we gave talks like what we're doing right now. Uh, unlike biotech and now even clean tech or some of the other technology sectors, many of the brave entrepreneurs are first time entrepreneurs. There was no ecosystem for them. If you were a life science startup, let's say in Kendall Square or you're doing a FinTech startup in Manhattan, within five minutes someone's gonna tell you, you need to meet Ms. X, Mr. Y, go see him, go see her, in this corporate, that incubator, and it'll, they'll help you get on your feet and figure out where you wanna go. That does not exist for the ocean economy, at least when we first started. First time entrepreneurs, no VCs, corporates weren't doing corporate venture, 
So that's why we started a platform first. We're not a nonprofit, but it looked a heck of a lot like a nonprofit. Um, and that's the idea of company building. Uh, so we uh, now are about to graduate next Thursday, if anyone's in Boston, our uh, fourth uh, um, incubator cohort. Uh, they run through a five-month program on company building. And then invest. If you can't get financing for your company, it's all moot. So we started until the Navy JAG gives us a cease and desist. We call it Blue Angels. So it's exactly what it sounds like, a bunch of angel investors investing in companies. And then lastly, now on this platform, we're looking to uh, raise a dedicated fund because the industry is maturing as a startup industry, blue tech, so we can uh, write bigger checks and move faster. Uh, or this is us now. Women, veteran, minority founded, hurrah. <laughs> Uh, Blue Swell, I mentioned that as an incubator, is uh, you get a $50,000 grant um, and you run through a four month, it could be as basic as like, how do you do your pitch? But really where we think we differentiate ourselves on the, on the platform is we bring our industry and domain expertise and, and experience. NOAA, in this corner of NOAA's world, let's say down in Mississippi, they may care about your coastal resiliency, monitor reporting and verifying technology. We're gonna make an introduction for you or um, a loft, which has web roots. Uh, we've helped them figure out where you're gonna pilot and, and uh, now they, where they're gonna prototype, sorry, and now they need to find a pilot. Still not easy, but Miles is plugging away. So that's what the incubator uh, does, and these are just some sample examples, and for the sake of time, I, I, I won't go through all of them, or I won't touch them. And then um, these are some of the companies that we've invested in. Some of them are uh, in the maritime space, specifically Fuel Trust. Uh, is trying to use buzzword uh, blockchain, right, of monitoring uh, the quality of fuel as well as counting your carbon for deep sea uh, shipping. Uh, we got a cold call from Mississippi. I had never been to Mississippi before um, four years ago, and they said, we've been tracking what you've been doing in New England. Can you come down and see what you can do for us in the Gulf Coast? So we helped create a new narrative around the blue tech, around this idea of an economic cluster, and the shiny object of that was, why don't you form an incubator accelerator? It was very successful. They're in their second cohort. Uh, we had startups coming in all the way from Singapore to London, uh, startups that didn't know where Gulfport, Mississippi was before. Um, so far, pretty good track record. Uh, we've, um, our most recent wins on the platform, um, and maybe you all can have a role here um, as we respond to the phase two. So the, Inflation Reduction Act from President Biden included giving NOAA an amazing amount of money. I think their deer caught in headlights. Couldn't happen to a nicer group of, federal, of a federal agency. One of the things they started was this idea of uh, more accelerators, exactly what I just talked about in the thesis. We won two of the phase ones, so um, we have until June to submit anywhere from 15 to 25 million four-year award to really take what I just described and go on steroids um, about how does more technology go out to sea in the U.S. tied to ocean sustainability. All right, let's, let's put some real examples to make it a little more real. That's Eagle. Eagle used to, he's about he's 23, 24 when I first bumped into him in our co-working space in Boston. He, he actually didn't finish BU and uh, I thought he was gaming. He, he was annoying me and then we started to talk and He's like, what are you doing? And he's like, I got a VR set. I got my first project with the Army. It's basically uh, basic training and you know, coming into a building, kicking down doors, standard Department of Defense stuff. So he said, hey, Eagle, are you interested in the ocean? He said, I don't know anything about that. So he was one of our first cohort members in our uh, first Blue Tech cohort uh, incubator. He applied, got a grant. We introduced him to Siemens Gamesa. Siemens said, we have an 80% dropout rate when we train our offshore wind service technician. A bunch of them get seasick, and the ones that don't get seasick when we take them to the North Sea really freak out. So funded by the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center and Siemens Gamesa, Eagle developed one of the first VR training sets. So if you put it on, you're doing this, and then you're looking down uh, on a very high wind turbine, translated, uh, get them to quit early. It's a lot cheaper for us. All right, so what's the takeaway? Eagle is in Boston, doesn't know anything about shipping. Uh, represents the tech community. He can code for anybody, but since somebody provided him a bridge, us, he's now coding for our waterfront technology. Second impact about Sea Ahead, 
where my government background comes in on economic development. You know, if you look at, let's use New Bedford and Boston. I don't know if anybody's from that area. You know, tell the two cities. Boston's economic boom. New Bedford is not a part of that party. Maybe until now with offshore wind. So where's Eagle hanging out now? He's hanging out in New Bedford in Rhode Island, the more economically depressed areas of our coast, as opposed to Boston. And he's providing tech-enabled workforce development tools of the future for everyone, starting with the welders and as such, not just for the, those with PhDs. So in a way, we feel that's a small example of what innovation can do to help even tackle the rising income disparity in the US, which continues to it's maybe flat now, but it, it's not in a good position. Uh, Fathom Science. This is a professor at NC State, and uh, I live in the Research Triangle in North Carolina. Uh, his tagline is, there's eight of them. Uh, he's an oceanographer, uh, went from Hui to teach, uh, and he's a tenured professor. And if I can, I'm not a data scientist, right? You know my background. <laughs> is um, All the weather, weather forecasting tools are getting more powerful today, and uh, we don't think there's enough of them who are integrating oceanography. It's that simple. So once again, example, we're ocean focused. They're about 100 miles off the coast, 75 miles off the coast. Who cares about better forecasting? Offshore wind to set your wind turbines, if I can tell you the density of offshore wind. Later when the turbines spin, the grid operator needs to predict what the grid looks like. So he or she needs to know what demand is coming in. That means they need better weather forecasting. Uh, they're talking to a shipping company about routing. And of course, the offshore oil and gas which says, look, if I don't have to go down two days because of an incoming storm and you can tell me that it's only gonna be bad for a day, I save a lot more money uh, from a safety perspective and then operations. So, little buzzy, digital twin. About four million in revenue already. Um, this is maybe the, one of the few uh, unicorns. This is a solar powered, it tax, doesn't have a propeller, raised over 100 million. Uh, autonom I call it an ASV, Autonomous Surface Vessel. Uh, they call themselves a data company because the venture community doesn't like hardware. Uh, their, cu cu their customers really still tends to be NOAA and the US Navy, but look at their backers. You got Silicon Valley, you got uh, corporates like Crowley, right, from the shipping sector. Uh, I let the Blue Tech, uh, I the Blue Angels investment in Natrix. This is by the airport in Raleigh, Durham, by us. Um, that down, that picture down there is a place which I've never been to called Hell's Hole in Louisiana. Evidently, Shell was having issues with the dock uh, around coastal erosion. They gave Natrix a, uh, a shot. They do a, they start with satellite imagery. They do their assessment. They do a 3D cement printer. And the printer is act, act, supposed to act like a substrate to grow seaweed and oysters. First question in due diligence, did it work? <laughs> yes, Shell was very happy and called corporate, and then Shell Ventures said, we might even invest in you, they have a full order buck. So just an example of where venture capital comes in because you have to attract um, investment. They're not the only one doing nature-based, but what, I, what attracted us to Natrix, one is it has a lot of headroom for technology. You start with satellite imagery, that's expertise. The printer itself is software driven, that has headroom for advancement. The formulation of the actual concrete has headroom for technology advancement in the fourth, which is still wide open, is if you can get monitor reporting and verifying and claim that I am carbon negative, if you can monitor and have it audited, you might be able to get blue carbon credits. That's the future. Still an open question. So that's the fourth possible area of, of high value added growth. So, so far so good. Um, Natrix. This is, people ask, are there any exits? This. Uh, Marine engineers, Coast Guard, I think, trained, uh, worked for, I love their story, is um, Grumman. Uh, Grumman said, don't care about what you're doing, not needed, didn't listen to them, did a deep AUV, it's almost like a space shuttle AUV, uh, has a payload. Uh, the VC community says, don't get it, don't really want to, so they went off and found some um, Wall Street people who wanted to support veterans, so they got their funding there, and they, uh, um, uh, Woods Hole gave them a quote that was way too expensive to actually pilot, so they went off and found a 3D printer somewhere in the Midwest. Long story short, they got bought out already, and they've had their exit. But I like the story I'm no embellishing, is that they got to their exit by li not listening to anybody. <laughs> right. Let's go back to shipping. Um, the backbone of the global economy, you know, 80% of world trade. 
Um, I think we all know this, but a lot of people don't. Picture's worth a thousand wor words, but let's just summarize. We in the US are looking to, we in the developed world are looking to get off of diesel, right? Electrification for all the reasons. The shipping sector, some of them complaining, are being forced to go from bunker C up to diesel. That just gives, just gives an idea of what the scale is. Is there a market value? Is there a market for bunker C other than shipping? No. Right? So even though shipping itself has a percentage, to give them credit, to give the shipping sector credit, has a relatively low carbon footprint considering its impact, it's what it does for us, less than 3%. It's based on efficiency and scale. On the rest of the metrics, it's dirtier than heck. It's basically liquid coal, as we know what bunker C is, particulate matter, black carbon, sulfur. So for a lot of people, when we talk about this, I like, never thought about it. Of course, you focus on that brown prime class three vehicle that drops off your six ounce packets four times a day. Oh, I feel a little bad about that. Well, chances are that four ounce packets came from Shenzhen on a, not that vessel, but a bigger vessel, right? So what's happening in shipping today, global maritime? It's not just uh, IMO 2050, right? There's criteria emissions, which I mentioned. They're being hit with uh, efficiency targets. Um, invasive species, you cannot die, you cannot dump, you cannot change a ballast water in Long Beach coming from Shenzhen and all the warm critters that are in the Pearl River Delta end up in the port of Long Beach and you can't use chlorine, right? So will lesser chlorination meet the new standards around the EPA and the UN? We'll see. Uh, not as if the shipping sector needs any more uh, uh, environmental pressures other than carbon. Then the other opportunity in shipping today is digitization. Really hard. I, I don't have my arms around this completely because I'm not a digital guy. We have members of our team who are. But one of the things we heard about what's so difficult about digitization, unlike other sectors, is if you digitize one analog piece of the shipping, not ships now, not engineering, shipping, the challenge is that the, the, the entity to your left and to your right in the value chain is still analog. So if you're the only one digital and you're connecting to analog, that ain't working too well. So, so far we haven't seen some big, huge hits on digitization, but yeah, for Johnny to call Bobby and send a fax to move the ship the, from birth A to birth B, we all intuitively know that's not gonna be the future. And then ESG, which I talked about. This is a loft with web roots. That's obviously um, um, a rendering. <laughs> um, quick comment on cruise ships, which we wanna put more time in. Cruise ships is a completely different animal in shipping. It is. Um, has all the issues that we talked about on shipping, with the exception that their cargo flushes the toilet, gets sick, uses plastics. It's a floating city. So, and it's in the US, unlike global shipping, it's, uh, which tend to be overseas, their headquarters is in Miami. Uh, and it's a completely different culture. It's Disney, right? Not Exxon, uh, or not, Exxon doesn't run its own ships. But, um, and, and it has ESG targets, right? You, People get upset in Charleston. Um, and lastly, they make a lot of money post-COVID. So uh, cruise ship sector is really interesting from an ESG perspective. They got a lot of challenges. They got money to spend. And it's the closest thing we are in shipping to a consumer products good, right? Going back to the spatial. So what if we had 20 to 30 gigawatts of offshore wind and we're asleep at night the load curve doesn't match the demand curve, which is a fancy way of saying excess electricity at 2 a.m. What do you do with that electricity? And, uh, um, uh, no, you raise your hand. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you can use it or you store it and you can store it and you can use it. There you go. Call that, let's call that power to X. Have you heard of power to that? Power to X? Power to X? Okay. Um, should, this is a mission. Should you all choose to accept it? This you can spend the next 20 to 30 years of your career on. Right, it's a simple concept. If you've got renewable energy, can you electrolyze the renewable energy? Right, and what do you do with that? You're gonna have hydrogen derivative fuels. Global shipping is looking at ammonia, methanol, not pretty, <laughs> and not green if it's not through a renewable. And then what do you do with it? Is well, one, the electricity could be used to electrify your waterfront, but we all know that the battery technology is not gonna get you from Bayonne to Rotterdam. So you're back to alternative fuels and hydrogen derivatives, the little, the ship in the middle is where it applies to us, right? Um, this is gonna have more focus. So why is this so, this building was from the Pratt estate from Standard Oil, Exxon, right, Standard Oil, 120 years ago. 
if power to X ever kicks off, let's say starting in the next 10 years, it would be that disruptive as oil entering our economy. New Jersey could be a source of energy generation. That's just crazy, right? Not Houston, <laughs> right? So some examples. Um, I wish we had our fund up and running because these, these three startup uh, postdocs at MIT showed up for a hot minute and, are, and said, someone told us you sh we should talk to you about shipping. And since then, they've raised 150 million. They have an ammonia catalyst. So uh, ammonia has more energy, energy density. So you can, in theory, you can put ammonia on the vessel. And then what do you do with the ammonia? You can burn it. That's happening. First ammonia engine, I think Wartzilla just, just um, launched. Or maybe their catalyst can strip the uh, hydrogen out and you put it through a fuel cell. $750 million valuation. Yikes. Um, Maybe confidential, maybe not so confidential, but from my GE days, um, what do you do with hydrogen if uh, uh, back to fuel cells is, so long story short, which is pretty cool, but it shows you an example what the US ecosystem is, is able to bring to bear, but the gap that we have with the global maritime sector. So 15 years ago, GE gets paid to do the next generation gas turbines, right? Higher temperatures, the, the blades start melting, they developed a ceramic coating. Long story short, it didn't work. They walked it down a hallway where I grew up in the R&D center in upstate New York and gave it to the small group that's working on solid oxide fuel cells. Solid oxide fuel cells is a ceramic-based fuel cell, unlike protein exchange. They found basically that the ceramic coating works great for the solid, solid oxide fuel cells. So long story short, the breakthrough here was a manufacturing breakthrough on how to make solid oxide fuel cells uh, much cheaper. This is at a technology readiness level of seven, just to give a sample of Emoji is maybe at three. GE, when they hit some financial difficulties, sold it to Cummings. Cummings is a truck company. So where is it today? You've got a facility up in upstate New York um, with a full pilot. Nobody can spell shipping, bow, stern. And we're talking to them. It's like, have you thought about maybe using this as a prime mover for shipping? Uh, and this is a little busy. This is from a web alum, Nikos. Uh, but why for why solid oxide fuel cell? It, it can have an efficiency if you use combined cycle of over 60%. Your low-speed diesel is what 40%, right? Using hydrogen, uh, it doesn't throttle well. But when you're at sea, your duty cycle is roughly 90% not cycling-ish, right? Um, so why am I bringing this example up? Is it's an example of American technology that doesn't have a bridge to global shipping. So wish us luck if we can try and get GE and Cummings to give us a mandate to see if we can introduce this technology to the Japanese and the Europeans. Oop, I went the wrong way. I think I'll just stop there. On, uh, that's it, my last slide.